The Greater Festival of Masks by Thomas Ligotti There are only a few houses in the part of town where Noss begins his excursion. Nonetheless, they are spaced in such a way that suggests there had once been a greater number of them that filled out the landscape, like a garden that seems sparse merely because certain growths have withered and others have not yet been planted to replace them. It even occurs to Noss that these hypothetical houses, counterfactual at present, may at some point change places with those which now exist in order to bestow on the visible a well-earned repose within nullity, for by then they will have served their purpose as features that gave the town an identity, and now is just the season for so many things to pass into emptiness and make way for other entities and modes of being. Such are the declining days of the festival, when the old and the new, the real and the imaginary, truth and deception, all join in the masquerade. But even at this stage of the festival, some have yet to take a large enough interest in tradition to visit one of the shops of costumes and masks. Until recently, Nos was among this group. Finally, though, he has decided to visit an establishment whose shelves spill over with costumes and masks, even at this late stage of the festival. In the course of his little journey, Nos keeps watch as buildings become more numerous, enough to make a street, many narrow streets, a town. He also observes manifold indications of the festival season. These are sometimes baffling, sometimes blatant in nature. For instance, not a few doors have been left ajar, even throughout the night, as if to challenge callers or intruders to discover what waits within and dim lights are left to burn in empty rooms, or rooms that appear empty if one does not approach their windows with an incautious curiosity and look inside. Less dire are those piles of filthy rags deposited in the middle of certain streets, shredded rags that are easily disturbed by the wind and twist gaily about. At every turn, it seems, Nas comes upon some gesture of festive abandonment. A hat, all style mangled out of it, has been jammed into the space where a board is missing in a high fence. A poster stuck to a crumbling wall has been diagonally torn in half, leaving a scrap of face fluttering at its edges. And into strange pathways of caprice revelers will go, but to have shorn themselves just anywhere, to have littered the shadows of doorways and alleys with wiry clippings and tumbling fluff. Reliquii of the hatless, the faceless, the impetuously groomed. As Nas walks on, he takes only a desultory interest in the sport of occasion he is witnessing for the first time since he settled in this place. But he becomes more interested as he approaches the center of town, where the houses, the shops, the fences, the walls are more, much more, close. There seems barely enough space for a few stars to squeeze their bristling light between the roofs and towers above, and the outsized moon, not a familiar face in this neighborhood, must suffer to be seen only as a fuzzy anonymous glow mirrored in silvery windows. The streets are more tightly strung here, and a single one may have several names compressed into it from end to end. Some of the names may be credited less to deliberate planning, or even the quirks of local history, than to an apparent need for the superfluous. Perhaps a similar need may explain why the buildings in this district exhibit so many pointless embellishments. Doors which are elaborately decorated yet will not budge in their frames. Massive shutters covering blank walls behind them. Enticing balconies, well-railed and promising in their views, but without any means of entrance. Stairways that enter dark niches. And a dead end. These structural adornments are mysterious indulgences in an area so pressed for room that even shadows must be shared and so must other things. 
Backyards, for example, where a few fires still burn, the last of the festival pyres. For in this part of town the season is still at its peak, or at least the signs of its termination have yet to appear. Perhaps celebrants hereabout are still nudging each other provocatively, still engaging in preposterous escapades they would not ordinarily dare to imagine, and, in general, indulging themselves as if there were no tomorrow. Here the festival is not dead, for the delirium of this celebration does not radiate out from the center of things, but seeps inward from remote margins. Thus, the festival may have begun in an isolated hovel at the edge of town, if not in some forlorn residence in the woods beyond. In any case, its agitations have now reached the heart of this dim region, where Nas is about to visit one of the many shops of costumes and masks. A steep stairway leads him to a shrunken platform of a porch and a thin door puts him inside the shop whose shelves indeed spill over with costumes and masks. To Nas, these shelves also seem reticent in a way hard to pinpoint, stuffed into silence by wardrobes and faces of dreams. Warily, he pulls at a mask that is overhanging a high shelf. A heap of them fall down on his head. Backing away from the avalanche of false faces, he looks at the sardonically grinning one in his hand. Brilliant choice, says the shopkeeper, who steps out from behind a counter at the back of the shop. Put it on and let's see. Yes, my gracious, this is excellent. You see how your entire face is well covered, from the hairline to just beneath the chin and no farther. And at the sides it clings snugly. It doesn't pinch, am I right? The mask nods in agreement. Good, that's how it should be. Your ears are unobstructed. You have very nice ones, by the way, in case someone calls out to you while your face is concealed by the mask. It is comfortable yet secure enough to stay put and not fall off in the heat of activity. You'll see, after a while, you won't even know you're wearing it. The holes for the eyes, nostrils, and mouth are perfectly placed for your features. No natural function is inhibited, that is a must. And it looks so good on you, especially up close, though I'm sure also at a distance. Go stand over there in the moonlight. Yes, it was made for you. What do you say? I'm sorry, what? Nas walks back toward the shopkeeper and removes the mask. I said all right. I suppose I'll take this one. Fine as if there were any question about it. Now let me show you some of the other ones, just a few steps this way. The shopkeeper pulls something down from a high shelf and places it in his customer's hands. What Nas now holds is another mask, but one that somehow seems to be impractical. While well, the first mask he chose possessed every virtue of conformity to its wearer's face, this mask is neglectful of such advantages. Its surface is uneven, with bulges and depressions which appear unaccommodating at best, and possibly pain-inflicting, and it is so much heavier than the one he picked himself. No, says Nas, handing back the mask. I believe the other will do. The shopkeeper looks as if he is at a loss for words. He stares at Nas for many moments before saying, May I ask a personal question? Have you lived, how shall I say this, here all your life? The shopkeeper is now gesturing beyond the thick glass of the shop's windows. Nas shakes his head in reply. Well, then there is no rush. Don't make any hasty decisions. Stay around the shop and think it over. There is still time. In fact, it would be a favor to me. I have to go out for a while, you see, and if you could keep an eye on things, I would greatly appreciate it. You'll do it, then? Good. And don't worry, he says, taking a large hat from a peg that poked out of the wall. I'll be back in no time, no time at all. If someone pays us a visit, just do what you can for them, he shouts before closing the front door behind him. Now alone. 
Noss takes a closer look at the shelves stocked with the other kind of mask the shopkeeper had shown him. How different they were from what he conceived a mask should be. Every one of them shared the same impracticalities of shape and weight, as well as having some very oddly placed apertures for ventilation, and too many of them. Outlandish indeed. Nas gives these new masks back to the shelves from which they came, and he holds on tightly to the one that the shopkeeper had said was so perfect for him, so practical in every way. After a vaguely exploratory amble about the shop, Nas finds a stool behind the counter and there falls asleep. It seems only a few moments later that he is awakened by some sound or other. Collecting his wits, he gazes around looking for its source. Then the sound returns, a soft thudding at the rear of the shop. Hopping down from the stool, Nas passes through a narrow doorway, descends a brief flight of stairs, passes through another doorway, ascends another brief flight of stairs, walks down a short and very low hallway, and eventually arrives at the shop's back door. It rumbles again once or twice. Just do what you can for them, Nas remembers, but he looks uneasy. Why don't you come around the front, he shouts through the door. There is no reply, however, only a request. Please bring out five of those masks to us. We're just across the yard at the back of the shop. There's a fence and a fire on the other side. That's where we are now. Well, can you do this or not? Nas leans his head into the shadows by the wall. One side of his face is now in darkness, while the other is indistinct, blurred by a strange glare, which is only an imposter of true light. Give me a moment, I'll meet you there, he finally replies. Did you hear me? There is no response from the other side. Nas opens the door a little and peers out into the backyard of the shop. What he sees is a patch of scruffy ground surrounded by the tall wooden slabs of a fence. On the other side of the fence is a fire, though not a large one, just as the voice said. But whatever signs of pranksterism Nas perceives or is able to fabricate to himself, there is no defying the traditions of the festival, even if one can claim to have merely adopted this town and its seasonal practices, however rare they may be. For innocence and excuses are not harmonious with the spirit of this fabulously infrequent occasion. Compliantly, then, Nas retrieves the masks and brings them to the rear door of the shop. Cautiously, he steps out. When he reaches the far end of the yard, a much greater distance from the shop than it had seemed, he sees a reddish glow of fire through the cracks in the fence which has a door leaning loose on its hinges and only a hole for a handle. Setting on the ground the masks he is carrying, Nas squats down and peers through the hole. On the other side of the fence is a dark yard exactly like the one on his side, save for the fire burning there. Gathered around the blaze are several figures, five, perhaps four, with hunched shoulders and spines curving toward the light of the flames. They are all wearing masks which at first seem securely fitted to their faces, but one by one these masks appear to loosen and slip down, as if each is losing hold upon its wearer. Finally, one of the figures pulls his mask off completely and tosses it into the fire, where it curls and shrinks into a wad of bubbling blackness. The others follow this action when their time comes. Relieved of their masks, the figures resume their shrugging stance. But the light of the fire now shines on four, yes, four, smooth and faceless faces. These are the wrong ones, you little idiot, says someone whom he has not noticed standing in the shadows and Nas can only stare dumbly as a hand snatches up the masks and draws them into the darkness. We have no more use for these, the voice shouts. Nas runs in retreat toward the shop, the five masks striking his narrow back and falling face up on the ground. 
for he has gained a glimpse of the speaker in the shadows and now understands why those masks are no good to them now. Once inside the shop, Nas leans upon the counter to catch his breath. Then he looks up and sees that the shopkeeper has returned. There were some masks I brought out to the fence. They were the wrong ones, he says to the shopkeeper. No trouble at all, the other replies. I'll see that the right ones are delivered. Don't worry, there's still time. And how about you, then? Me? And the masks, I mean. Oh, I'm sorry to have bothered you in the first place. It's not at all what I thought. That is, maybe I should just... Nonsense! You can't leave now. Give me your trust, and I'll take care of everything. I want you to go to a place where they know how to handle cases like this. You're not the only one who was a little frightened tonight. It's right around the corner, this, no, that way, and across the street. It's a tall gray building, but it hasn't been there very long, so watch you don't miss it. And you have to go down some stairs around the side. Now, will you please follow my advice? Nas nods obediently. Good, you won't be sorry. Now go straight there. Don't stop for anyone or anything. And here, don't forget these. The shopkeeper reminds Nas, handing him a pair of masks that are not a match. Good luck. Though there doesn't seem to be anyone or anything to stop for, Nas does stop once or twice and dead in his tracks, as if someone behind him had just called his name. Then he thoughtfully caresses his chin and smooth cheeks. He also touches other parts of his face, frantically, before proceeding toward the tall gray building. By the time he reaches the stairway at its side, he cannot keep his hands off himself. Finally, Nas puts on one of the masks, this being the semblance that was sized so well for him, but somehow it no longer fits as it once did. It keeps slipping as he descends the stairs, which look worn down by countless footsteps, bowed in the middle by the tonnage of time. Yet Nas remembers the shopkeeper saying that this place had not been here very long. The room at the bottom, which Nas now enters, looks very old and is very quiet. At this late stage of the festival it is crowded with occupants who do nothing but sit silently in the shadows, with a face here and there reflecting the dull light. These faces are horribly simple, falling far short of countenances exhibiting familiar articulations, but gradually they are assuming features, though not those they once had, and the developments in progress, if the ear listens closely, are not entirely silent. Perhaps this is how a garden might sound if it could be heard growing in the dead of night. But here, on this night, the only sound is the soft creaking of new faces breaking through old flesh, and they are sprouting very nicely. With a torpid solemnity, Nas now removes the mask he is wearing and tosses it away. It falls to the floor and lies there sardonically grinning, fixed in an expression that, in days to come, many will find strange and wonder at. For the old festival has ended so that a greater festival may begin, and of the old time nothing will be said, because nothing will be known, but the masks of that departed era, forgotten in a world that has no tolerance for monotony, will find something to remember, and perhaps they will speak of those days as they loiter on the threshold of doors that do not open, or in the darkness at the summit of stairways leading nowhere.